Welcome, everyone. Folks might continue to pop on the call here, but we're on the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Rural Disability Research and Practice Summit presented by RTC Rural. My name is Jeff Gutierrez, and I will be going over some technical details and housekeeping before we get started. This meeting is being recorded. The recording, a transcription, and the safe chat will be made available as soon as possible after the summit. Please keep your mics muted throughout the presentations. If you are on your computer, click the microphone symbol in the bottom left to mute. If you are calling in, press star six to mute your phone. You might also manually mute you. We might also manually mute you if we notice background noise. If you have questions, please include them in the chat. RTC staff will be monitoring these for the discussion portion at the end of the session when presenters will have the opportunity to respond. There is closed captioning for today's call provided by Montana Relay. To use closed captioning, you may select CC on your Zoom toolbar. If you're using your phone, this may look a little bit different because of reduced menu space. You may want to tap the more dot 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 to adjust meeting settings. Today's sessions will include presentation slides and various speakers. You can adjust your view mode by selecting gallery or speaker view in the top right of your Zoom window. You might want to have speaker view for today's meeting to provide the best experience in this format. Once you are in closed captioning, tap your screen once to close the toolbar to make room for captions. You can make speakers larger by selecting the dot 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 on their boxes and pinning them using the push pin icon. Then you can adjust the size of your bo the boxes to your preference. If you have any trouble, you can direct message Justice Ender from the chat and he will help. Once again, we please ask that you keep your mics muted to ensure clear communication from our wonderful panel of speakers. And now I will pass it over to Katherine Ibsen to introduce today's session. Hello and welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for the second day of our summit presentation today focused on rural digital access. So uh, my name is Katherine Ibsen. I've had the pleasure of serving as the director of the Research and Training Center on Disability in Rural Communities, or RTC Rural, the last four years. And today's and yesterday's presentations reflect the perspectives of many people. We want to have the opportunity to showcase some of our research at RTC Rural, but we also want to give voice to people who are living in rural communities and really have on the ground experiences that we want to showcase and honor. So we're excited to share our work alongside the voices of disabled people who live and work in rural communities. Before we start, I want to highlight and thank Jeff and Justice Ender, who've done all the behind the scenes work to get our summit presentations in order. I want to thank our panelists who've contributed to the framing of the discussion and offer per personal insights on the issue. And I also want to acknowledge Nidler. Nidler's provided long standing funding to support the health employment and community living goals of rural people with disabilities, and it's a very, very valuable contribution. Finally, I'd like to speak just a moment about language and how we talk about people with disabilities. So we at the RTC Rural use both person first, person with a disability, and identity first, disabled person, language in our presentations. Our speakers bring their own norms to the discussion, and please honor the varied voices represented and focus on the important messages that are shared. So I have an opportunity to first set the stage for what we're going to cover today. So um, before I start, I just want to define what we mean by a summit. And a summit is a strategic conversation that brings together different perspectives. And to this end, we've included multiple voices regarding rural digital access. I'll begin the presentation by describing different dimensions of access and new federal initiatives to address them. This will be followed by an overview of digital access across the US by RTC rural researcher Lily Griman. 
Lily has explored the geogra geographical distribution of resources across the US, including access to the internet. Her work focuses on the intersection of race, poverty, disability, and rural factors to explain persistent disparities. Andrew Myers, another researcher at RTC Rural, will place these findings into a rural context to set the stage for the perspectives of our varied rural voices. Our rural panel reflect different perspectives that highlight some of the pros and cons of digital solutions. Not everything is uh, a panacea in terms of outcomes for digital uh, digital um, solutions. So talking uh, first, we'll lead off with Alice Kruger, who is a former teacher and education researcher who founded Virtual Ability in Second Life. She turned to online community to address issues of social isolation she experienced following her diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Maxie Yates is a CIL consumer who gained technology and Zoom skills by establishing a relationship with an independent living specialist at Wyoming Independent Living Center. Maxie's community expanded because of her increased technology skills and access. Isaac Baldry has been a member of the Rural Institute Consumer Advisory Council since 2008, and his work has focused on youth issues and assistive technology. In this summit, Isaac will bring his unique perspective to setting up an ABLE account in a rural community. Finally, we welcome Ashley McFadden, who's the executive director of the North Carolina Disability Resource Center. Ashley brings extensive experience in rural service provision and outreach, and she'll talk about some of the tensions and difficulty associated with building community initiatives that are place specific in the context of growing reliance on online solutions. At the end of the presentation, time permitting, we welcome audience questions to delve into these issues further. So let me get started and talk about digital access. There are many different dimensions to access. First comes broadband. Broadband is necessary, but not necessarily sufficient for providing digital access to people in the community. Broadband means high speed internet or internet that is uh, greater than 25 millibytes per second of download speed. It ranges from 25 to 1000 millibytes per second of speed and as um, people who have used both slow and fast internet, those vary widely, significantly, and um, certain methods are still very, very slow by current standards. From, slow, sl from slowest to fastest, we have DSL, which uses telephone lines, satellite, cable, and fiber optics. DSL and satellite, the two slowest options, are disproportionately used in rural communities. Costs are also a significant barrier for people who are trying to access and use the internet. Equipment costs, such as printers, scanners, computers, or phones even in some, pace, some cases, as well as the repairs to keep those things running can prevent people from accessing the internet, at least easily. Internet service is also expensive. It's estimated to be $70 per month for a household to get internet service. And it has higher rates for communities with only one provider. So without competition between providers, that cost of $70 goes up and that's predominantly rural. <clears throat> the most expensive option for getting access um, is satellite. It's the option of last resort, particularly for low resourced areas. Digital literacy is shaped by broadband access and costs. 
Learning gaps are significant for individuals who have historically had limited access. Particularly with technology change, there's a steep learning curve, particularly for those who are entering the game late. The adoption gap is wider for those experiencing housing insecurity, marginalized racial and ethnic groups, disability groups, and those experiencing language barriers. And then finally is accessibility. And accessibility is an important part for people with disabilities who are trying to interface in an online community. A study conducted by WebAIM of the top 1 million web pages, this is depressing, found that 96.8% of them did not meet accessibility standards. Next slide, please. In the context of these constraints, who lacks access? It is estimated that 42 million people do not have access to broadband or high speed internet. And the most affected groups across all constraints are those living in rural communities, those living on tribal lands, and those with low incomes. So just for groups with a median household income of less than 30,000 per year, only 57% live in households with broadband internet. And I want to highlight or just harken back to what we talked about yesterday in terms of personal care attendants. Personal care attendants would fall into this group if they were working full time providing services at their wage rate. So it's it's low income workers who are not going to get this access. Growing dependence on digital solutions for healthcare, education, and employment creates some, some differences or disparities that are hard to overcome. I'm going to go through just some of the pros and cons of these um, digital solutions and how they may not uh, be equally um, available to people in the community. So first, let's look at healthcare pros. Healthcare or telehealth has really expanded access to certain services for people. Communities that may not have mental health services can access those services remotely, and Medicaid now will pay for some of those services remotely. So what are some cons? Competition between in-person and online delivery can sometimes gut a local community infrastructure, um, such as rural hospitals. When you have outside people providing services, those are no longer part of the income coming into a hospital or a practice. There's also some de decreased confidence in clinical decision making for certain uh, kinds of health issues. And it is noted that one out of three rural residents cite connectivity issues to accessing those services. So let's look at education pros. There's access to additional resources and online learning options without leaving the community. So I can go to college from rural Montana. There's self-paced opportunities and there's specialized training that I can access to bone up on a skill for a job. But there's cons as well. And really in terms of reinforcing the impact of limited digital access. There's a disproportionate impact on poor rural states. One study that I looked at indicated that over 40% of K-12 students lack internet in Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Mississippi. Employment is another area where there are pros and cons. There's with internet or digital solutions and remote work, there's additional opportunities to access professional jobs. And in the next five years, it's estimated that 28% of professional workers will be able to work fully remote. Remote work can also reduce barriers for people with disabilities in terms of transportation and inaccessible infrastructure or limited economic opportunity. 
However, there are some cons. Shifts towards online only or reduced in-person services for employment resources, such as job service, job applications, and access to benefits can be particularly impactful for those who are low-wage earners and lack digital um, skills. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in a situation where it's recognized that these gaps exist, and it is reflected in the 2021 Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that has devoted specific resources to overcome some of these limitations. There's $47.5 billion that's available to states, and with particular earmarks for rural and tribal lands. There's an affordability connectivity program to reduce the cost of internet service by $30 per month for people at 200 or below the federal poverty level. And there are local grants to build community skills or digital skills in to, so that they can adopt those resources. These measures, however, may not address the tensions between choice and opportunity. For instance, lost local infrastructure with growing dependence on online solutions may hurt some of the people that need those services the most. There's differences in capacity to compete for funds and utilize programs. So at a very basic level, a rural community needs to have someone who can write the grant and bring in those resources to the, to the community. And there's compounded disadvantages in terms of difficulties associated with catching up. So with this overview, I wanna pass the microphone to Lily. Her, researcher, her research highlights the areas most impacted by the digital divide and disparities we should consider as we, we uh, really examine digital access and all that it has to offer. Great, thank you, Catherine. Can people hear me? Can I? Great. Oh, one sec, I'm gonna just change up my, a couple of things here. So, Hello and welcome, and thanks so much for joining us uh, at this summit. And um, as Catherine said, I'm going to talk a little bit about what internet access looks like across the country. And Catherine did a great job talking about and starting us off on thinking about these digital divides, and that what really what we've seen is that digital divides where uh, we have groups of people who are less likely to have the same amount of access as, as others, such as people with disabilities, people who are marginalized in a variety of ways. Um, this digital divide works towards um, exacerbating and perpetuating um, currently existing inequalities, such as inequalities in employment and around poverty. Um, and this divide exists not only across different demographic groups, but also across space. And so that's when we really start talking about rurality, but not just rurality, also uh, various regions across the United States that uh, the ability to access internet um, is not kind of equally spread across space. And so the research that I'm gonna present here today was really asking this question of what are the, what are the social and spatial characteristics of the digital divide? So we'll be looking at some maps and we'll be talking about some fancy analyses and I'll try to be as clear as possible with them. If you do have questions about any of the like more technical details, you can send me a message um, and I can put my email maybe even in the chat and folks can follow up, but we might not have time to get too much into it today. Um, oh, one sec. So currently this is all written up in a manuscript that is uh, uh, um, currently under review, and so hopefully will be published soon. All right, so we are going to be talking about and looking out in, in access to the internet, and as Catherine illustrated early on, um, the defining and measuring internet access is really challenging because access is a multi-layered concept. 
right? It can be you have access at a house. It can be you have access through your phone. And then how you have that access can vary. Access is also geographically dependent. You have to have a necessary amount of infrastructure in order to you know, actually have it, even if you could afford it and use it. Um, and also, uh, an individual uh, needs to be able to know how to use it and afford uh, the costs of use. We don't have a wealth of data across all of these things. Um, and for our research and the research that I've done is primarily working with the American Community Survey, which is the survey conducted uh, through the US Census Bureau. And they define access um, this way. At this house or apartment or mobile home, do you, have a, do you or any member of this household have access to the internet? And you can respond by saying yes, by paying a cell phone company or internet service provider. Yes, without paying a cell phone company or internet service provider. And three is the other response is there's no access to the internet at this house, apartment, or mobile home. And the data that we are looking at for this is at the county level. So the numbers that we'll be looking at represent the percentage of a county that has uh, the percentage of households in a county that have access to the internet. And so the national across the country, that rate is about 75, 76%. So about three quarters of the households um, in the US uh, have access to the internet. Or <laughs> Excuse me, I'll rephrase just to make things extra con confusing. The average rate of, of household internet access at the county level is 76%. And that range, however, looking at counties is, is quite sub substantial. So what we see is counties are reporting rates as low as 35% of households having access to the internet, um, up to 96% of households having access to the internet. And I guess we'll say, well, no, you don't need to know too many details. If you really want to know more about my methods, you can reach out. <laughs> um, so this slide here is a map of the United States, and we're mapping at the county level the percentage of households with internet access. And they are uh, colored in four different bars from a light blue, almost white, to like a darker teal. And the lighter color of the county indicates a lower percentage of Households in that county have access to the internet. Um, great, yeah, I forgot I did the automation. Thank you, Jeff. Go ahead and just do all of them. So these pink circles that are showing up right now are highlighting areas and regions of the country. You know, they're kind of, you see these white uh, counties spread out all over the country, but definitely concentrated in some areas like along the Mississippi River, the border of Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. We see quite a few in South Dakota, throughout New Mexico, Southern Texas, and Alaska. Um, and I think a thing to really note, um, actually, let's go to the next slide and see where I'm at with this. So um, actually, go back, Jeff, would you? Thank you. Um, so I think something that really jumped out at, to us when we first started looking at these data were that it was really looking like there were some patterns, real patterns, um, both related to rurality and demographics that were playing out in the counties on this map that had lower rates of access to the internet. And it was really mirroring a lot of information that we knew of, of regions that had uh, high rates, higher rates of disability, as also as along with higher rates of uh, marginalized uh, racial and ethnic groups. Um, and so we were wondering, like, oh, I guess you know, probably we see some connections here between kind of persistent marginalization um, and economic disadvantage and access to the internet. So we wanted to know, our question was essentially, well, what are all of the factors? Can we pull, do we have a question, what are the factors that contribute to a county's internet um, rate, the rate of access at the county level? Um, what were the, what are the demographic, social, and geographic characteristics that um, play a role? And can we build a model to predict what these rates will be to better understand what is what are the underlying forces at play? So now we can go to the next slide. 
Great. So we ran what's called a spatial error model, which is a spatial regression analysis, um, which is essentially an analysis to do just what I said, to, to take into account all of these different factors and predict uh, what is at play that's determining why places have lower or higher rates of internet access. So what we did was we put all of these variables into a model controlling for race, ethnicity, age, disability, employment, education, rurality. And then what made it a spatial model is that we accounted for um, some spatial relationships. So that's kind of some fancy statistical stuff. What we found was that there were lower rates of internet access were associated with race, specifically as an ethnicity, race, specifically Hispanic, Black, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, that we had lower rates of internet in households with those care or in counties of households with these characteristics. Um, with counties with higher, uh, older populations, lower rates of employment, lower education rates, and more rural um, communities. I'm just going to look at my notes here to see. So yeah, I yeah, go to the next slide. Thanks. So I want to note that disability actually did not come out as significant in our analysis. So race, employment, age, uh, those came out as significant, but disability did not. This suggests that disability on its own does not necessarily play a huge role in um, predicting whether or not, uh, in, in predicting internet access at the county level. But what we do know is that disability is really highly related to all of our other variables that we found. So we know that among certain uh, racial and ethnic groups with much higher rates of disability, rural places have much higher rates of disability. Uh, people with disabilities are more likely to be unemployed. And so we are suggesting, positing that there is actually, it's actually the intersection of disability across these other marginalized identities that could be, um, that is, is kind of playing a role. We think that disability matters, but it's not coming out necessarily in this analysis. And so to take this a little further, <laughs> we thought, well, okay, let's, Let's think about what our analysis, so we have this model, this model says these are things that go into predicting internet. And it's kind of like, okay, yeah, I guess it makes sense. So what, I suppose, right? Like places with, that are, um, that have higher rates of poverty. Oh, and I should mention poverty was not in here again, because it is highly, highly correlated with all of the other variables that we included and that can throw off your analysis. So while we, re we recognize that that's an issue, but it's kind of being accounted for in some of our other variables. But what we were really curious about was, so here our model does an okay job of predicting internet access for a lot of the country. But what about the places that it doesn't? Our model is was actually accounted for about three quarters of the variability across the country, but we wanted to know about places where it actually did a poor job where it under predicted um, or over predicted the rate of um, analysis. So we analyzed the model's residuals to try to understand how and where the model did not provide a good estimate. And residuals represent the difference between what our model predicted and the actual value as provided by the census. So for example, the model predicted that Montgomery County, Georgia has an internet rate of uh, household internet rate of 67%, but the census reports that that county has a rate of 76%. Um, and so that suggests that our model actually under predicted the rate of that county by nine percentage points. Um, and so we wanted to dig into this a little more and understand. So we mapped them because I love to make maps and that, that's my background. Um, and so what you see on the screen here is that same map of the United States, um, again, of counties with lower, wider, uh, lighter colored counties having lower rates of internet access and, and darker colored counties having higher rates. And now what's highlighted in pink are the borders of the counties that we all kind of selected where we determined were, were highly, were really poorly, were poor fit for the model. The model did not do a good job predicting internet access in these places. Um, and what you'll see is that in many of the places that we saw earlier where we were really noticing lower rates of internet access, 
But in those areas and in those regions, uh, so again, in the South around Arkansas, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, Southern Texas, uh, Alaska, New Mexico, South Dakota, our model is really, is not performing well. It's not doing a good job. Those things coming together are not, are not really explaining what is happening um, here. So while our model was able to account for substantial amounts of variation across much of the US, it was, it really does appear that it's less reliable for some of the most disadvantaged communities. And in the paper, and I'm happy to share this with anyone as well, we look and at and compare all of these counties together um, uh, with the rest of the counties that the model does a good job. And we see that these are in fact counties that have significantly higher rates of uh, Black, American Indian uh, uh, populations, higher rates of older populations, higher rates of, uh, and that are much more rural. So for these counties, there's something else going on that's not just what we had talked about. And I think what we're really saying is this suggests that it's failing to really understand what is happening, what's producing this inequality across space. And for future research, something it would be really wonderful to be able to get more robust data, particularly from the census, to better understand how these interactions of multiple marginalized groups, how it's that interaction and potentially an experience around racism, ableism, uh, those kinds of other social contextual factors uh, have uh, a role to play in, in impacting whether or not you have access at the household level. Um, so that's it. I think I went a little over my time, and I hope that some of that made sense and wasn't too confusing because I know it was kind of a, a lot of um, content in there. So I appreciate any, any questions um, that anyone might have towards the end. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Andrew, who's going to dig a little bit more into uh, rurality and what is rural and how we're just talking about all these complicated topics on complicated topics. Thank you, Lily. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Andrew. And as Lily mentioned, we've used this word rural a few times already. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what do we mean when we say rural and specifically like who, what or where is rural. Um, and rural is kind of a sticky word uh, because there's over a dozen different definitions of what rural means, and each of them apply to different types of geographies. So some use like county lines, other use zip codes or census tracts. Um, others may simply classify anything outside of a designated urban area as rural. Um, and they also use different metrics for determining what counts as rural. So that could be population density, that could be housing, that could be travel patterns and different types of economic activity. Uh, I also want to briefly mention that uh, at the end of last December, just a couple of weeks ago, the Census Bureau updated how they define rural. Um, and I'm happy to chat more about that later if folks are interested. But basically what that means is that there are now more people living in rural America, not because of the, not because of moving, um, but because they lost their urban designation. Um, so that does have impacts for kind of what we're talking about today. And so basically depending on what definition we use, rural America could be considered to encompass anywhere between 72 to 97 percent of total land mass in the U.S. Uh, and anywhere between 15 to 20 percent of the total population. So you know, there's a lot of variability there. Um, but what we really mean is that in general, rural is a term that is broadly used as meaning anything that is not urban. Um, and so folks in rural areas, just to kind of give an overview, um, and Lily already touched a little bit on this, is that they tend to be older than urban populations. Uh, they also report higher rates of disability, uh, worse health outcomes, and less formal education. Economically, there are also fewer job opportunities in rural areas, and though they also tend to be lower paying. Uh, the high wage jobs that do exist 
tend to be quite dangerous. So think of things like mining, logging, construction, fishing, and a lot of other forms of resource extraction and manual labor. Um, and it's important to note here that these occupations tend to have much uh, higher rates of serious injuries, which can then also lead to a disability later in life. So it kind of creates a little bit of, uh, of uh, kind of a feedback loop, if you will. Um, and that, so what this economic context means then is that rural residents also report higher rates of poverty and unemployment. Um, and many of the characteristics that I just described can be attributed to, to disparities in rural services. Uh, so healthcare tends to be further away and less specialized. So if someone needs to go see a specialist for a certain health condition or what have you, that typically means they're having to drive out of town to a larger city. Um, and they're also in a smaller uh, community, there can also be privacy concerns uh, around health, healthcare, um, because rural communities tend to be pretty closely knit. And that can contribute to certain things like um, stigmas around certain health conditions. Uh, and while people drive uh, mostly personal vehicles in rural areas, there are many of those who can't. Uh, public transportation is usually inadequate, inappropriate, or unavailable. Um, and part of the challenge there is that transportation is expensive to operate in rural areas. Um, internet, internet access is also a challenge. Uh, rural residents typically pay uh, higher costs uh, for slower speeds than most urban residents. And part of that is attributable to a uh, lack of competition. There are, uh, there are fewer providers in rural areas, um, and they, which means they can also typically charge higher rates. Um, there's also limited digital infrastructure and investment, um, but that is changing recently with some of the bills that Catherine discussed earlier. A few things that are important to uh, consider when we talk about rural America is that rural places are unique. Uh, each community has their own challenges, their own resources, and of course, their own opportunities. And it's really important to remember that rural residences, uh, rural residents are their own best experts. The last thing they need are outsiders coming in and telling them how to best improve their community, right? They know their own community better than anyone. Uh, and part of this means that urban approaches often may not work well in rural areas that might not translate, uh, which means that rural America is by definition and by need innovative. It's important to know though that this innovation is really more of a forced innovation, usually to address inequities to in access. Um, and one way in which rural folks got creative was during the COVID-19 pandemic. As many of you likely remember, much of our lives shifted online as schools, offices, coffee shops, and other establishments closed. Uh, and so this created a sudden increase uh, in internet usage. And that really put a huge strain on rural broadband services. Um, and for many, the internet speeds were so slow that it was not even functional to complete like an online quiz for class or attend a Zoom call for work. Uh, and so one strategy that some families adopted was quite literally shifting their schedules. So they would sleep during the day and work during the night so they could use the internet when fewer people were online and speeds tended to be much faster. Uh, and those who did not have internet at home found themselves camping out in school and public library parking lots to access the Wi-Fi. And so there's a picture on this slide of a woman uh, working in the back of her SUV while accessing the internet in a parking lot. And there's a sign there that says Wi-Fi zone, come on and park and work. Uh, and so while these are certainly innovative solutions to address inequities in broadband, it also denies residents what has been called digital dignity. In other words, feeling like you have the same digital access and autonomy as everyone else. And then ha this has real consequences for how people are able to engage in the digital world. Um, a challenging reality, though, is that rural services in rural areas are more expensive to deliver simply because of the sheer geography of rural places. Um, what that means is that, you know, for example, public transportation 
has to cover long, longer distances to serve fewer riders. And what that means is that the cost of operating that service is, is higher per mile and per rider. And the same is true of broadband services. Fiber optic cable has to cover longer distances for fewer subscribers. Uh, and in some cases, satellite internet may be al an alternative, um, but that is also very slow and very expensive. Um, and so in a, in a market-based economy like ours, cost efficiency and profit are often priorities. Uh, that's not a surprise to any of us. Uh, but as digital access expands and becomes less expensive, it could also undermine personal choice. And it's important here to remember that hospitals are businesses that provide a service. And if that service can be delivered more cheaply, for example, over telehealth, one might begin to question the validity of operating a bankrupt hospital, which many rural hospitals are. So while telehealth can help supplement healthcare in rural areas, it could potentially also risk replacing in-person care. Um, as one person put it, uh, telehealth is simply a way of them checking off a box to say that they met with you, but isn't really real care. And that could be debated. Um, but today, our panelists will explore how these tensions manifest on the ground in rural communities. And some of those opportunities are, you know, reduced environmental barriers that we see in communities that are not accessible, and, and in turn, better access to economic opportunities such as remote jobs and community engagement, such as virtual socializing, uh, like Second Life. Uh, some of the challenges include, you know, actually getting internet access and affording it, uh, developing computer skills, and the fact that digital access cannot always replace in-person interactions. And so our panelists today are, uh, next slide, yeah, Alice from Rogersville, Tennessee. We have uh, Maxie from Casper, Wyoming. Isaac from Miles City, Montana, and Ashley from Tower City, North Carolina. Uh, and with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Alice. Take it away. Let me give us just a moment to change over our screens here. Alice is going to give us a special presentation. Alice, are you doing all right? Okay, just took me a while to get all the buttons pushed. All right. We have more buttons pushed today than before. Okay, so thank you to the Rural Institute for inviting me to share with you today. My name is Alice Krieger. I'm a rural resident with multiple sclerosis. I use a power wheelchair to get around. The picture on the left on the slide screen shows you a picture of me and my chair visiting the Rocky Mountain um, National Park in Colorado. Today I live in a valley in the Appalachian Mountains of Tennessee. I do not have cell phone reception here. There is no public transportation and the nearest neurology care center is over an hour and a half drive away. I do however have internet services, yay, provided by my electric company along their overhead wires. I am the founder of Virtual Ability Inc., a nonprofit organization that provides virtual world services to persons with disabilities. On the right of your screen, you see the logo of Virtual Ability Inc. If you're not familiar with virtual worlds, the uh, view that you're seeing right now is of me presenting in a classroom in the virtual world. And this is a 3D environment, which is accessible on your computer, in which you represent yourself as an avatar. So on this slide, you see me again on the left. I'm happy to be outside. On the right is my avatar in the Second Life virtual world, and her name is Virtual Heron. You can also see me sitting to the left of the screen. 
Virtual worlds are persistent, so they're available 24 seven on your computer. In the world, you can interact with other people who are also here in avatar form. And you can also interact with objects in the virtual world. In many ways, the virtual world is a model of the physical world. In the right-hand picture, you can see my avatar presenting at a recent conference in Second Life on the topic of healthcare decision-making. Our virtual ability community in Second Life has been around since 2007. We have over 1,300 members from every continent except Antarctica. Our members have one or more different types of disabilities, including physical, mental, emotional, developmental, and sensory, such as deafness or blindness. Many of our community members access our computers using assistive technologies, such as foot-operated trackballs, on-screen keyboards, or screen readers. What do we do? We help people with disabilities enter and learn to use virtual worlds. The photo on the left of the screen shows three newcomers to Second Life at the beginning of our Newcomer Orientation Center, where they can learn how to operate their avatars. We encourage everyone to participate in any of the various activities that are available in the virtual world that they happen to be interested in. So the photo on the right you see is one of our community members riding horseback, something she always wanted to do but could not do because of her disability. We want people with disabilities to thrive in the virtual world because we know that there, is a, there are numerous benefits to being here. We don't consider virtual worlds to be a replacement for the virtual world, for the real world. They're just the, they're simple in an extension of the real world. Why do people with disabilities come into virtual worlds? To socialize, to learn, to work, to create, to find peer support, and to have fun. The image on the left of the screen here shows the entrance to the path of support that we built on our Health Info Island. Here, virtual world residents can find information on how to access the over 120 different peer support groups that meet here. On the right picture, you see a university for credit class that meets in Second Life. So how do rural residents benefit from using virtual worlds? Well, you get to interact with people from all over the world whom you would not ordinarily get to meet. In the left-hand picture, you see a presentation by a doctor from the Mayo Clinic. And we've also attended a session led by the Dalai Lama. Virtual world services can parallel those offered by Centers for Independent Living. We can offer companionship, education, support, healthcare, employment, all without transportation issues. Virtual world services can be an important enhancement to the lives of rural residents especially for those of us with disabilities. We can participate in important healthcare decision-making. On the right is a poster for a session put on in Second Life by the US Access Board when they were seeking input on making medical exam equipment more accessible. We didn't need to travel to Washington DC to testify. All our testimony was done in Second Life. I see a bright future for rural residents, especially those of us with disabilities in virtual worlds. Virtual Ability Inc. will be here to show you how that can be. You can email us at info at virtualability.org. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Alice. And now, Maxi, if you are all ready for your presentation. Yes, OK. Thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Maxi Yates. I'm a 63-year-old uh, Caucasian woman. I have long white hair, purple frame glasses. I currently live in Casper, Wyoming. For the first six, 58 years of my life, I lived in big cities where everything you could dream of was available. 
I moved away from all of my family and my friends to Glen Rock, Wyoming to have affordable housing. Quite literally, I had to make a choice to either live out of my, live out of my car in San Diego or make the trek to Glen Rock not knowing the outcome. Glen Rock has about 2,500 people. There's no traffic lights, no residential mail delivery, and has traveling local governments, like for example, your vehicle registration, community services like SNAP, uh, social security, driver's license renewals, and public health nurses were available on a rotating schedule. Even getting telephone connection was challenging, let alone accessing the internet. The only medical facility is a clinic with very limited services. The nearest hospital is 25 miles away in Casper, which is where I live now. And there is no public transportation. The quality of medical care is much lower than I have ever experienced. I was adapting to the social aspects of being in a small town when I had a traumatic medical experience that left me bedbound for two and a half years with extremely limited supports. I was new to town, knew very few people, and had one caseworker who helped me get to my out of town healthcare appointments, but was otherwise left to my own devices. I needed assistance with showering, as sometimes I went up to 17 days without. I also needed support with out of town grocery shop, groceries and other shopping, preparing foods, laundry, and cleaning. Due to the lack of resources and supports in Glenrock, my caseworker frequently suggested I move to Casper, Wyoming which has about 58,000 people. And there were and are more services available, including a hospital, medical specialist, home health care, which is necessary for my daily living. I, found, I finally found affordable housing at a senior apartment complex. My new apartment did not have grab bars in the shower, which was a safety requirement for me. I tried working with building management unsuccessfully. Over the course of several days, I made a series of phone calls to no avail. Health and Human Ser Services suggested calling the local Center for Independent Living, which I had never heard of, and Lisa answered the phone. After hearing my story, Lisa said, I can help you. I was pleasantly flabbergasted and relieved that someone could finally help. Lisa is an independent living specialist at the local Center for Independent Living. She scheduled an in-person appointment with me to evaluate my situation and immediately began to support me in advocating for myself. <clears throat> Hold on a second. Uh in advocating for the grab bars in my shower. As an independent living specialist, her purpose is to support those in need to advocate for themselves. Despite opposition and harassment from building management over the course of the next five months, we finally got those safety bars installed. Lisa identified early on that I was quite isolated and in need of additional support specifically access to the internet. She is such a remarkable person. We established an amazing rapport that soon turned into a strong friendship. Was That for me was unexpected and life-changing. Technology for me is scary. It's difficult, frustrating, and extremely stressful. Lisa was willing to sit with me and patiently support me while I learned the basics on my laptop. It was important for me to learn Zoom in order to progress to a point of meeting with her and eventually others online. 
She gradually offered me opportunities, opportunities on the internet that would expand my social life despite my physical isolation. It eventually allowed me to connect with others, host a painting party online, and I was asked to participate in a research study with, uni with the University of Montana via Zoom, where I assisted with the development of a curriculum for individuals who are socially isolated, just like me. I attended weekly Zoom meetings as part of the development team and met with other consumers and CIL staff from across the country. I also attended the Association of Programs for Rural Independent Living Conferences in conference in October last year. The conference allowed me to connect with another with a number of other people with disabilities and organizations which helped me realize that I could do a presentation just like this one. My ability to participate wasn't just about the equipment or connectivity, but skills that continue to challenge me. Through this process, I discovered I wasn't the only one who struggled with an ever-changing technology landscape. In fact, I found there are a lot of people with differing impairments, and I am part of a much larger community. It was necessary for me to have someone sit down in person and patiently walk me through every step on an ongoing basis. I think the in-person step-by-step support is unique and much needed for di digital access. The Independent Living Center was the first organization who provided me with a staff member who could or would assist me at this level. And it opened up a whole new un universe for me. I learned that differing abilities don't hinder people from working or gaining education or improving their quality of life, which motivates me to continue to overcome my own technology challenges. There is so much that I have gained <laughs> through this experience. <laughs> I still, I'm so touched with all of it, <laughs> which began with the CIL and allows me to connect with others on Zoom. I am so grateful for the un unexpected benefits of working with Lisa and her peers and learning new technology skills. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maxine. Isaac, are you ready to go? Thank you for having me as part of the panel. I think it is important to have the end user of the product contributing to the conversation in the disability community. 100%. Connected to you, Isaac Zykad Pro. I am here today to talk about my experiences with the internet enable accounts. A real picture of the internet or cell service in Eastern Montana. I hope my internet stays stable for the whole meeting, but especially while I am presenting. If I freeze up, it is not, because it is cold outside. Just a weak signal, on my home internet, in Miles City. If I were not at home, but had traveled, to family out in the country, I would not even have enough cell service to text, let alone, a way to get on the internet. I just have to go 10 miles, and I can lose all service. I want to move to sharing about ABLE accounts. Some of you may not know what an ABLE account is. ABLE stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience. It is a piece of federal legislation that passed in 2014. This allowed states to create tax advantage saving programs for eligible people with disabilities. Montana passed legislation and created Montana ABLE accounts the end of September 2017. I had been following ABLE accounts on the national level and was waiting for my state to create these accounts. 
I opened my account November 1st, 2017. I was interested in Able accounts because I use a lot of assistive technology. You may have noticed my voice. I use technology to speak and to get around. I have my computer with specialized software for daily use, including work. These pieces of technology are expensive. Some items are covered by insurance and some are not. My iPad and app to speak are not covered. I have to purchase these items. If I can only have up to $2,000 in resources to remain eligible for Social Security, it means I have to buy pieces one at a time so that I do not go over the resource limit. My ABLE account would mean I could save money and then buy all the pieces of a tool at one time. I opened my account with the $500 I had saved. I added money as I could, and my parents took advantage of the Montana state income tax deduction available for up to $3,000 per person for their contributions each year. The unexpected. Social Security was reviewing my business and stopped my monthly payment. Unfortunately, my bills did not also go on pause. I accessed my ABLE account to pay for my monthly housing and food expenses. It was way less stressful knowing I had a backup plan. The pause lasted a month and I was able to deposit the repayment back into my ABLE account. In 2019, my wheelchair accessible van started to give us problems. I did not have reliable transportation. I told everyone I knew that if they wanted to give me anything or help me, they could deposit money into my ABLE account. I was saving for a new van. It is the only year I reached the maximum contribution limit. I kept looking for ways to add money to my ABLE account. I sent the gift code out, including posting on Facebook once that did not work. If there is an online contest for ABLE contributions, always do them. I kept adding money to my account, as did my family. At Christmas, when we were driving across North Dakota, we had to drive with the red engine light on. I said, that is it. I am spending my money on a new van. I do not like calling tow trucks. My name is on the title of the new accessible van as a co-owner. My mom and I split the cost. I was even able to get accessible parking plates. I watch the money in my accounts regularly. I am comfortable with online banking because I learned how to in high school. I knew I would need to balance a checking account and pay bills online. Paper and pencil do not work for me. I insisted. My teachers helped me learn to do things over the computer. One of the things I really like about my ABLE account is watching it grow. Not only does it increase monthly with deposits, but I get free money. My account investments make me money. At one time, I had over $2,000 in free money. Just dividends. I could not make that much in a savings account. I do not know what I will need my ABLE account for next, but I will keep adding to it. It is a tool I need for security and independence. If you had never done online banking, it could be hard to learn a new way. I was already accessing my accounts from my local bank online. It is how I pay my bills and watch the use of my debit card. When I get paid for work, I get a check in the mail. I am not comfortable scanning it for deposit. I still like to take my check to my bank for deposit. ABLE accounts are all online. You cannot see or touch the money you have, that is hard. It is scary to put your money somewhere that you can't go to when you do not have much money to use.
in learning about ABLE accounts, I tried to read the plan disclosure documents with my screen reader. First, there are 130 pages. That would take me a long time. Second, concepts constantly change in the document. What I need to know is hard to find. It is too much for me to process. This is where I need help with managing my ABLE account. Just trying to understand all the paperwork. I have to have someone go through the pieces with me in chunks so I have time to think about what that means and do I understand correctly. I have a power of attorney just for these pieces as it is too much to understand. I think you would need to be an attorney to understand the paperwork. Now to blend the internet and ABLE accounts. You may remember I said, ABLE accounts are all online. You cannot go to the bank and access your ABLE account. You have to get on the internet. Home internet can be expensive. When we tried to use the affordable connectivity program, it meant we would have to change our plan and with the discounts we would lose from our bundled plan, the end bill would be the same. To use free internet in the community, you would have to go to the library. Depending on how far you want to walk and the weather, you may need to use community transportation. That means you need to plan at least a day in advance to arrange and schedule a ride. Once you are at the library, they have several computers, but you can only be on the computer for 30 minutes, then if people are waiting, your turn is over. If you were not prepared, completing the online application for an ABLE account could take you the full 30 minutes or more. There is a lot you need to know. The disclosure documents are supposed to help you, but we already talked about the problems with those. You need personal information like your name and where you live, plus your social security number. Next, you have to verify your identity. You will need a driver's license or a state-issued ID card. If you don't have one, you would have to go through that process. Another one you have to set up online. If you make it past those pieces, you now need to know your disability code. Pick which one is closest to your medical diagnosis. Toward the end you will be expected to understand how you would like to invest your money. As you can see plain language is not a part of this process. In my ideal world, I would be able to manage my ABLE account on an app, on my phone. I could check on my money, deposit money, or pay for things, all by buttons in the app. My bank has an app for my checking account. It is easier to log in on my phone than on the computer. For an app, I just have to touch the buttons. I can even use Face ID now, instead of typing passwords. On my phone, I don't need internet access, just cell service. I have cell service in more places. I have to be home or use my hotspot to have internet access. Not everyone can afford a hotspot. I count it as part of my business. I would like to see that you could also open an ABLE account on the ABLE app. To open an account, it would guide you through each step and save your progress in case you didn't get to finish. A checklist, marked completed, would help you know when you were finished with all the steps. This would give you time if you needed to find something like your ID number or even get an ID if you did not have one. I have not convinced anyone that an app would be better. I do not think they have considered how to make the accounts and user friendly. I think they should include end users in our levels of planning and developing ABLE accounts. There is a national ABLE resource center, but the step connecting them to the banks seems to be missing. I think an app could make the accounts available to more people and provide a way for people to be more independent in using their ABLE accounts. 
If you have to be a person with a disability to open an account, don't you think the process should be disability friendly? I hope we get there. Lastly, everyone, everywhere, needs to be able to get on the internet. No one left behind. Thank you very much, Isaac. Fantastic. Ashley, are you ready to go? I am. Thank you, Jeff. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ashley McFadden, and I am um, the executive director of Disability Resource Center, which is a center for independent living, and it is located in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, I currently reside in one of our most rural counties, which is Columbus County. Um, we are a small cell. We have two full-time members and two part-time staff members, but we serve five counties and um, the geography of those counties, they're all pretty large and um, two of them are, are actually very rural. So I've been in Columbus County since 2019 and I live in a small town called Tabor City. Um, we are... We have about four red lights, if that gives you just the just thought about how big we are. Um, the thing about our county, though, is to my commute from Wilmington to Tabor City or from Tabor City to Wilmington is about an hour and a half and 45 minutes of that commute is going through Columbus County. So it's a very large county, even though it's very rural. Um, I am our only staff member who lives outside of Wilmington at the moment. Um, one of the great things about our county is it is diverse. We have um, the Wakamasuian tribe that has tribal grounds located in our county, um, which is a population that is um, one that we see a lot of poverty in. And we also see a lot of um, underserved and um, just lack of access to a lot of services. Um, next slide. So I was fortunate to work with Lily and Raina um, from RTC Rule, and we did a mapping project for Columbus County. Um, it was amazing to see the services that did exist here and um, see them on a map, an actual living document, um, but to also realize that the services that existed here really don't exist inside the county, inside the community. They existed um, in Wilmington, a lot of them. Um, and because of where we're situated, we're right at the North Carolina, South Carolina state line. Um, people also were going to South Carolina, um, Myrtle Beach area for services. So um, what we lacked meant that you had to commute. And whenever we started this rural mapping project, we also learned that a lot of the uh, organizations that said that they served our area, they either didn't exist anymore or they had no location in our area. So um, it was a little rough connecting with some of them, but we also saw that having someone who lo was located in the county um, did increase our ability to be able to connect. Um, that was something that my Center for Independent Living had not had before because um, of the 14 years that they had been open, no one has ever lived outside of Wilmington, outside of an urban area. Um, we were able to connect to many people um, through finding, just happening to find one person who uh, was able to show us the way. Um, next slide. So in this area, there is a huge, huge um, disparity with economic instability. And the reason for that is lack of services, um, lack of access to services, transportation options. There's no Uber, there's no Lyft. Um, we have a county transportation, but to go from my end of the county to the middle of the county, which is where pretty much um, our hospital and all of our doctor's offices are located, it is $20 each way. Um, the majority of people that my center serves can't afford to pay $20 each way when they have multiple doctor's appointments per week. 
um, the employment options as someone spoke about earlier, they are low paying. And in order to find something that is going to pay you to be able to sustain yourself, you're going to have to make the commute that I make. Um, one of the things that we've also discovered here is that even if you find employment and it's gainful, um, because of just the lack of um, resources in the area, it still will not allow you to be able to maintain yourself um, without government assistance. So um, we learned that access to government assistance with COVID, um, it, it just hindered a lot of things. There were a lot of people who um, were using the telehealth or wanted to use telehealth, but they didn't have access to any equipment, any technology, or they didn't know how to use what they had. We also have um, a really bad infrastructure here. So um, with the students who were in school, there were areas that had no access to school because there's no um, broadband, no DSL or anything like that in their area. So there were a lot of challenges that came to us whenever we started looking at um, access to services and employment options. And just this area itself has been, um, it was the yam capital of the world and tobacco was a big thing here. And now with all of that dwindling away, it's been um, just kind of dying off. And that is making services and resources and organizations not want to come into the area. And the ones that were here, they are leaving the area and going to the more urban areas. Next slide. So um, we've had a history of hurricanes. I'm sure everyone knows that we've had a lot of hurricanes in this area. And that has caused a lot of people to um, come in and claim to be helping the area. And when it comes down to it, there have been a lot of issues with organizations, nonprofits coming in to say that they're going to help the area, getting grants, getting funds, and then leaving the area and not spending the money in this area or spending the money in a more populated area. That makes um, the trust issues of the community rather large. Um, I am originally from Florida. I'm retired from the military and when I moved here and still to this day, when I go to meetings or whenever I go to meet with someone, they don't hear that Southern draw that many people here have. And so they say, who are you? Where are you from? Who do you know? Um, that's always the first questions because they just have such a trust, is, trust, trust issues with outsiders and um, organizations saying that they're there to help and then not helping. Um, one of the biggest issues that we have is a lot of the organizations that say that they help Columbus County are located in New Hanover County, which is Wilmington, and which is an hour and a half commute. They don't have anyone located local that people can come in and talk to or that people can set up appointments with. It's either do it by phone or they need to, the person needs to make the commute. And we know that that doesn't always work, especially for people who have disabilities especially when there's no transportation. So like with our county transportation, you can go once a week to Wilmington. Um, the ride is about $50, which is astronomical whenever um, a lot of the people that we serve only just now make 914 a month. Um, so it just doesn't make sense. And then there's a lot of people who don't have family members here to take them places or their family members are working during the hours that they need to get to these appointments. So COVID was a blessing for our organization because it actually um, made me have to be in my community. Um, since there was no traveling back and forth to the office, we were able to, um, we kind of used remote services. We used the term remote services, but we discovered that using technology was not gonna be the way to do it. So we partnered with some other organizations in the area and we brought the services to people and met them where they were still um, during COVID because there were enough offices that were closed and people still needing to have their needs met. A lot of the challenges that we helped with during COVID were people who needed to do their um, recertifications for food stamps, for other government um, assistance. And there was no way for them to do it because social services was not open. 
um, and they were just mailing out forms and everyone is not good with sending in forms or just ensuring that they fill out the right spots. There's a lot of catches to that. And so people were losing their benefits. And so we partnered with the local organization and provided four desktop computers that allowed people to have access to um, technology. And we were there to work with them during this time to ensure that they could keep maintaining their benefits and um, have access to technology to do doctor's appointments and things like that. We also partnered with the Affordable Connectivity Program or ACP, and they provide tablets to individuals who receive any type of government assistance. And they were, um, we paid for about, I wanna say about 75 of our consumers. Um, it was $11 a piece for them to have free Wi-Fi for five years, as well as the tablet. Um, which gave them access at home to um, technology. The only issue with this was a lot of people were not familiar with how to use these tablets. And with us being such a small seal, it was a little um, rough for us trying to coordinate in different areas, different locations, um, how to provide access to these and how to help people learn better to um, use this technology. So it was a learning process for us but it also um, taught us so many good things and allowed us to grow. Even though we are small, um, we lost staff during this time. You know, there were a lot of office closures. Um, there were some services that weren't able to be provided, but we were able to increase other services like peer support, which is one of the ones that helps on social isolation. Um, a big issue that we have is just the presence in the community. Um, we have a lot of people who right now rely on travel to their appointments. And there are a lot of organizations, um, doctor's offices to be included. We just had our hospital here remove a primary care that was located in Tabor City. And it is the only primary care that was located in Tabor City. So the majority of the town went there. And so now they have removed it to another town that is about 20 minutes from Tabor City. And um, a lot of people are trying to figure out what they're gonna do because they don't have the ability to travel. So now they're losing access to their healthcare. Um, and this healthcare was in line with their specialists because the specialists were at the hospital. So now they have to try and figure out, you know, if they're going to be able to make their doctor's appointments, if they're going to have to relocate to one that is closer, but in another state, um, it just caused a lot of issues. So with lack of transportation, remote services, and just um, the lack of trust to outside sources, it's been, it's been a rocky, rocky um few months or a few years during COVID and discovering all these issues that existed way before COVID, but no one chose to address them. Um, we are hoping that there will be funding in the future to help these rural communities. Um, now that we've discovered so many disparities and issues um, coming to light, um, we don't have the capacity to always, you know, fill all these gaps, but with increased funding, we can hire more people and hopefully build these supports and be able to provide technology training and provide, you know, access to these, to accessible uh, technology as far as um, different types of apps and things that will help people who need to just have just a little bit extra in order to be able to use their technology. Um, we hope that everyone will um, take the time to reach out and just, you know, make those, make those relationships with other people in their community. Just make sure that you make as many relationships as you can, connect with anyone who is willing to be boots on the ground with you. And thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. Wonderful. Lily, Justice, do we have questions from the chat? Uh, and if anyone had trouble entering their question to the chat, you can press star nine on your phone to unmute or raise your hand using the bottom toolbar and we'll do our best to respond. All right, thanks, Jeff. We have um, just a couple of questions actually. So yeah, if um, I'll try to scan and see if anyone has a question, please go ahead and, and raise your hand. But 
Um, I'm going to read a couple questions just around the, the technical stuff of rural broadband and let justice answer these. Um, so we have a couple questions around what is the minimal MS ping from a server needed for acceptable responses in rural broadband? And is Starlink generally acceptable? Um, and I don't know if people are familiar with Starlink. It's a new satellite internet, but Justice can answer those really quick. Sure. So if you have a lot of pings are typically around like 70 um, uh, milliseconds. If you get over 150, you're going to start noticing lag and problems. And this is especially going to affect people that are doing anything where your computer or your phone or your device is sending signals back and forth to a server somewhere really rapidly. Um, so it's really noticeable if you're playing like a video game. But it's even noticeable if you're navigating around the internet quickly. Um, if you're doing something slow, like downloading a single big file, you're probably not going to notice it as much. Um, as for the Starlink question, so Starlink is interesting. I think the most comparable thing to Starlink is to the other satellite providers. So what Starlink did is they came in and they put satellites much lower in the sky to reduce that latency. Like the, literally the physical distance between your device and the Starlink satellite is smaller, which is good because that speeds it up. The problem that Starlink has that's really interesting is because the satellites are so low in some rural areas, well, in, anywhere, built things like buildings and trees and canyons and mountains will physically block the signals because the satellites are so low in the sky. Um, so I think, and this is just my personal opinion, I think for rural, for the rural world, like the rural communities across the world, I think Starlink is a big step forward. I think you wouldn't want to compare Starlink speeds and access um to for rural areas in the u.s to internet access to broadband internet access in urban communities i think there would still be a pretty big disparity thanks justice and andrew also put a comment in the chat noting how it's quite expensive uh, we have another question from Gemma, who's in the second life audience um with Alice um, or Gentle, um, has anyone spoken of the need for government funding being involved to provide access or just like at the state level? And I don't know if anyone wants to address anyone specifically. I could kind of talk about it. I'll talk first and then someone else can. And I think, you know, we, I don't, I don't, um, I don't know the details, but I do know there are kind of general rumblings occasionally about internet The because this has become such an important component of society, uh, a, a push towards uh, internet being regulated as a public utility. But I think we are, are very far from that. Um, and I don't know if there's anything in the new infrastructure bill that's talking about that or any more about how that works if anyone wants to speak to it. Lily, just as I'm thinking about, I'll, I'll jump in for a second. This was a big issue depending on the administration too, whether the internet's considered a utility or whether it's like who regulates it even. Mm -hmm. um, it, it sort of varied. Um, and there's other issues around net neutrality that become, that, that get impacted. Um, and even work that Lily's done looking at FCC maps, sometimes um, areas are considered covered by the internet that we know are not really covered by the internet uh, or with, with good broadband, like comparable internet access. Um, I think the biggest, even below the state level, I think the biggest uh, push or the, or the, the, where the, a lot of the most effective efforts have been are community co-ops um, where maybe it's not, a, you know, it's not, um, financially viable for like Verizon or for Comcast or whoever to go in and provide broadband service because they just aren't serving enough customers for the cost of laying lines, but your community bands together to get that funding. Um, I think the barrier is sometimes when you do that is that you do have to argue that you're not actually being served. Like when you go apply for federal funding or you go, yeah. you go apply for these community things when Verizon says that you're served or when Comcast or, you know, charter says you're, you're served. Um, but your community knows that they're not. 
Yeah, thanks, Justice. And I want to just build on this. We've got some good conversation going on in the chat, um, and we have one minute left, but just want to build on this, that there are some data access and quality issues at play across all of these topics that we're talking about. There are data quality issues in relative to internet access, and Justice mentioned the FCC, that's the Federal Communication Commission, and they um, they have they have a data, they often really do say that a lot more communities are served than actually are, and it's an issue in how they define served. So for example, a, a census block or some small unit of geography, which can be quite large unit of geography if we're talking in, in rural, actually, like physically large, uh, if only, if even a single household in that whole unit has access to the internet or good quality internet or quality at not even a good level, um, it will count as served. So it's undoubtedly leaving out quite a few. We have data quality and access issues also in rural, across rural communities, um, and then also within disability. And so uh, trying to access information at the intersection of these three things becomes really challenging in order to get quality data and um, there's room for advocacy in, in that. So thanks. I see we're a minute after. I'll turn it back to Jeff to wrap us up. Well, this concludes the presentation. And thank you, everybody, for your involvement and for being here for these important conversations. Um, I did get a message from Alice in, in Second Life. And the folks in virtual ability wanted to uh, say hello to everybody here. So those of you who have other things in your day, thank you very much for coming. And we appreciate your support. And if anybody would like to stick around and say hello to the folks at Virtual Ability, Alice, if you're still on, go ahead and uh, let everyone say hello. And thank you everyone for your involvement once again. Hello, everyone in Second Life. We've got the audience in the auditorium, the Sojourner Auditorium, right? This is this is our classroom, actually. Oh, it's the classroom. Fantastic. This is not our auditorium. We have a couple of classrooms here, and about half of our people had to leave. They have other things they're doing. But um, if some of the people in Second Life would like to uh, say where you're from in the world or concerns, whether you might have about rural Disability. I'm just going to ask you to do that, Alice. Thank you. <laughs> I know we have people who are from all over the world. Um, Itiko is saying he's glad to hear that people are having these conversations. Delia is from rural Massachusetts. Itiko is in a small city in Wisconsin. Uh, Brielle is in Austin, Texas, but has lived in rural Texas. So we have quite a few people here who have rural roots. Fantastic. Oh, Brian just raised his hand. Yeah, Brian. Hey, not a representative of, uh, you might have called them Second Life, uh, but I just thought I'd say hello for a minute if there's a, a space for me to do that. Cool. I'm an autistic artist advocate. I have done this unique life of in and out of special ed, of being a person with a disability and needing support and being a person providing professional and less professional support services. I work as a professional advocate over at the University of Colorado in the School of Medicine. I personally had a dream fulfilled when I got to work as a job coach at a therapeutic writing ranch because every week I had several times a week that I got to get out of Dodge or in my case, Denver. And um, as I worked there, I continued to develop connections in rural and it just was like so heart fulfilling. And I would love to be able to do um, what has been shared here today, uh, find a support network and be able to um, re you know, un, unroot and re, re 
reroute in the rural communities. Thanks for letting me share. Brad, you would love the uh, opportunities to create and share art in Second Life. We have mm -hmm. numerous, numerous art museums here and many of our members are artists. Nice. A great connection that just got made. Uh, Todd, you've got your hand raised, I see. Yeah, Alice, I was just curious about uh, the size of some of the the meetings that you have and um, the uh, the logistics. Are you able to um, handle that on your own or do you use outside folks? I'm going to plug into uh, Second Life, but I'm just curious of uh, what your take is on where you're at right now. This seems like an, an enormous enormously powerful tool to to get people in different cultures as well as uh, people all around rural America together. It is. Um, we obviously are a very small part of the, the huge overall Second Life, but when we hold conferences, our attendance ranges, at, well, it varies for each session, obviously, but from 25 up to 70 per session in a, in a group. We have, it is possible to hold larger conferences in Second Life. Ours are not as large as some. We have some conferences in Second Life that have hundreds of people attending. There are thousands of people in Second Life every hour of every day. So you can experience being a member of many, many different kinds of communities. Uh, many of the people in our community are uh, educators or they are uh, people who are role playing. There are people from uh, other countries here. I know Masha. Masha, where are you from? Um, let's see who else is from other countries. Oh, they they have left, but we've we've got people in our community from everywhere except Antarctica, and we can provide a lot of different kinds of services for them. Yeah, this is Todd. It must be challenging. I've had the conversation. Uh, Meg Tracy and I together have talked with uh, Marcy Roth at the World Institute on Disability, having those time zones and languages uh, to deal with. But it's it's I can't think of another more cost effective way to do it. This is this is wonderful. What we do is we we have some of our um, activities at different times of day, so they're not always US centric. And we do have community members who speak a number of other languages. It's mostly our US people who are stuck in only English. Yeah, you're laughing, but it's true. It's a, it's a lack in our education system. This is Meg Tracy, just thinking about um, other languages, how how is ASL integrated into Second Life? Right now, the avatar fingers are not capable of doing ASL. But what we have done is we have had people use a video call. So the, the person in Second Life, who is the, the uh, terp, the interpreter, can do a video call to the person who wants to see it in ASL. We also can do CART in Second Life. We have transcribers, not quite as good as your transcriber. She's a very good transcriber, but um, we have never yet found a person we could not accommodate in Second Life. We do have one community member who's deaf blind, and we have a blind community member who accesses Second Life in Braille. So we're pretty accessible. Yeah, that's great. And just as this is Meg again, just as you're, as I'm thinking about having a video conference and being on Second Life, I imagine not being as technical as Justice, but you know that I would need more, more access to the internet, more uh, digital access. Um, again, I'm rural. So I have mm -hmm. rural digital access and I'm doing both Zoom and Second Life. Mm -hmm. It's possible. It's good. <laughs> I can't do um, I can't do Skype also. You know, one one time I tried to do Zoom and Skype and Second Life. That did not work. <laughs> so interesting. <there> are, <laughs> 
Hey, Alice, this is Todd. I'm curious um, for for work, uh, Megan, I do uh, offline around this, but do, have you ever looked for funding uh, that would allow for uh, more access for more people?